What you're about to watch in this room is a strange mortal combat between a man and himself. Good day, residents of the internet, and welcome back to the show that today pits two foreboding anthologies against each other. One is primarily in black and white, the other in glorious technicolor, and I want to live in neither, because it's Twilight Zone versus Black Mirror. The OG show from the genius mind of Rod Serling is going up against stiff competition with the modern look at ourselves and what we could or already have become. It's the ultimate deconstruction of two dystopian delights that stand the test of time. A matchup that could only happen in the Twilight Zone. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Here's how we'll determine a winner. Round one, tomato meter slash audience score. Round two, iconic moments. Round three, cultural relevance. And then we'll toss a wild card round into the mix to help settle the score. And since this is the internet and it lives on forever, if any of those pig doctors from the Eye of the Beholder episode are watching, this is what beauty used to look like. All humans, aiming for this. Ask any of your swine brethren, this is what handsome is. Got it? It's settled? Okay, now we can start. Two starts? Two stars? Wasn't a meaningful encounter. They pick the most dangerous enemy they can find. And it's themselves. Round one, tomato meter slash audience score. Back when the Twilight Zone began, Rotten Tomatoes were just old veggies you'd bring to a comedy show. Critical gauges have certainly evolved since 1959, but so has the Twilight Zone. After its initial run through 1964, the show took a long breather. It was then revived as a movie in 1983, and then a new series run through the later part of the 1980s. It went dormant again, then returned on UPN for one season in 2002, like Pennywise the Clown, it would then depart only to return years later in its current iteration on CBS with Jordan Peele stepping into the Rod Serling curator role. Today, however, she will have no choice but to revisit history again and again. Peele has certainly turned the zone back into a fresh property after the ill-fated movie and UPN run both earned rotten scores on the tomato meter. But the show has yet to return to peak form in the 1960s. The original Rod Serling era has an average tomato meter score of 82%, and weighing it down is its only rotten season during that time, season 4, at 57%. All told, The Twilight Zone carries an average of 64%. Not bad for a concept that has spanned half a century and is still going strong. But what happens when The Zone glances into the mirror? Black Mirror debuted overseas in 2011 and now has five seasons worth of technological tomfoolery brought to us by showrunners Charlie Brooker and Annabelle Jones. Black Mirror has an impressive overall average of 83% on the tomato meter. That's even more striking when you consider that the most recent season is by far the lowest with a still fresh 67%. Season 1 set the high mark at 98%, and its last three seasons on Netflix averaged 79%. For funsies, that revolutionary Bandersnatch project, that was at 72%. Sounds awesome. I see a trend. Critics love these shows when they debut. They're new, they're different, they're creative, and then it gets tougher and tougher to match the original gut punch as the shows carry on. Is that how audiences feel too? The average audience score for Black Mirror is 81%. And that once again handily defeats the Twilight Zone's barely fresh average of 63%. And oddly enough, it's the Jordan Peele iteration of Twilight Zone that's weighing it down the most at a rotten 39%. Bouncing that out is the original Rod Serling run, which tops anything else in Twilight Zone or Black Mirror, at 96%. You see, kids, since the 1960s, art has been all downhill. We had Zone, we had the Beatles, who were heavily influenced by the Monkees. That should actually be an episode of Twilight Zone. You are obsolete, Mr. Wordsworth. Speaking of Black Mirror, that show also is experiencing its audience score a low point with its most recent season. Season 5 is being a party pooper at 45%. Maybe the quality is dipped, or maybe 2020 feels like one long episode and we don't have the appetite. These shows are many things, but uplifting ain't necessarily one of them. May I suggest Golden Girls or Mama's Family instead? Better late than... Blanche! Pregnant! <laughs> the Twilight Zone gets major points in this and every round for inspiring tons of artistic endeavors, including Black Mirror. But in this round, it's not just about how you start, it's how you finish. And middle. Because of that, Black Mirror squeaks by with a win and takes a surprising 1-0 lead over Twilight Zone. 
Jesus. I... Round two, iconic moments. And now is where Black Mirror could shock the world. In just five short seasons, the show has managed to carve out its own unique spot in the cultural zeitgeist. A word I'm 70% I just utilized accurately. It's impressive enough that Black Mirror managed to separate itself from being labeled just another Twilight Zone imitation. All the iconic moments it's already provided us, that's just icing on the cake. A cake that probably tastes like licorice, I'm betting. The most obvious example would be the moment that surprised the world and dominated social media in Bandersnatch, an interactive movie revolution that allowed the viewer to make decisions and suffer consequences. It was almost like a choose-your-own-adventure novel. Maybe a little too close. It caused a lawsuit by Choose Co, who owns those book rights, and I dare anyone to prove that they had heard of Choose Co prior to right now. But that episode also snagged two primetime Emmys, and for once gave viewers a positive outlook on a future where we get to interact with our favorite TV shows in a whole new way. It was ahead of its time, in as much as time exists. That's a considerable left turn from the norm that is Black Mirror. Usually, tech either falls into our hands or is already in existence, and it's that obsession that leads to our downfall. Take the very first episode, the National Anthem. I can't fully express the places to which this episode takes our imagination, but needless to say, it was the perfect opening salvo for the episodes to follow. And if it's bleak you won, how about that one with John Hamm that got everyone talking? And then crying and then sign, and then basically giving up. What's it called? The Christmas episode. Perfect. We're all in a never-ending cycle trapped inside our minds. Fa la 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 When one thinks of specific moments that unfolded in the show, you could look at Striking Vipers, one of the comparatively happier episodes, Watching gamers fully immerse inside a video game, and then to see where that action goes, it's groundbreaking. Or when we realize just how far humans are willing to go to avoid embarrassment and worse in Shut Up and Dance. Webcams and video games weren't a thing yet when Rod Serling kicked off the Twilight Zone, and his imagination didn't need them. His initial shepherding of that show gave us arguably as many iconic moments as any other program in history. I'm even talking to you, Monday Night Football. Bum, 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 bum. Monsters are due on Maple Street, Mirror Image, and Where Is Everybody are all landmark episodes in TV history. As is Big Tall Wish, in large part due to the fact that it was unfortunately rare to have a black lead of a show in the early 1960s. As a fan of the program myself, I would instantly refer someone to William Shatner's slow unraveling in terror at 20,000 feet. There's a man on the wing. There's someone on the wing. Or a patient waking up to a very different looking doctor in Eye of the Beholder. Twilight Zone is at its best in those moments when the lead character first starts to sense something is amiss. Witness Anne Francis in the after hours realizing that she is in fact a mannequin or even at the very end of Time Enough at Last, as Burgess Meredith has one accident that leads to a lifetime of mental torture. More recent incarnations of Twilight Zone haven't borne as much memorable fruit, but there were a few moments. In the 1980s, guest stars like Bruce Willis would show up, and in his episode, Shatter Day, he was directed by horror master Wes Craven. I'd also point you towards the Nightcrawlers episode and its ultra-violent conclusion from The Exorcist and French Connection director William Friedkin. Twilight Zone has always attracted A-list talent, so when Jordan Peele agreed to take the reins for a new generation, it was no surprise. Already, his takes have given us some clever updates on Twilight Zone originals. The comedian, and not just because one's talking right now, and the new and improved terror at 30,000 feet. The replay episode had a darker Groundhog Day vibe, as does the Topher Grace starring Try, Try episode. The best one yet, in my not humble at all opinion, would be Blurry Man starring Zazzy Beats. You know what? I think we can beat this. And for giggles, I do have to point out that the 2002 reboot at least had Forrest Whitaker host, and there was an episode where Katherine Heigl went back in time to kill baby Hitler. I'm pretty sure even the stuffy suits at the TEC in the 1994 classic Time Cop would have approved that mission. If Heigl wants to do it, sure, send Katherine Heigl. I like 27 dresses. Mother! 
The shared DNA of these shows is that beautifully twisted reveal where we, the audience, are rewarded for our suspicion and are allowed in on the plot. In Black Mirror's San Junipero, we're hanging on before we realize, oh, that, ah. And in Twilight Zone's Aliens, it's the very end when we get conked on the head with, wait, were the... These quotes weren't even me playing coy with you and not giving away spoilers. That was genuinely, word for word, my reaction when the shows gave us the full Monty. Can I use that catchphrase in this context? Um... Black Mirror is off to a hot start, but it's going up against over 60 years of Twilight Zone memorable moments. And that's just me talking about the Rod Serling era. It was like 60 years worth of greatness. Twilight Zone takes round two, and we're all deadlocked at one apiece. No logic, no reason, no explanation. Just a prolonged nightmare. Round three, cultural relevance. We're all tied up, but the Twilight Zone starts round three with dynamite field position. If it's cultural relevance the customer wants, uh, we don't have to go run to the back and check the stock room. We have decades upon decades of greatness that has influenced pretty much every other show ever in some fashion. So why do I even bother talking out around three? Is it because I get paid by the word? Black Mirror does actually have a shot in this round, and not just because the show name itself is constantly used to describe anything weird that happens in our lives. Worldwide pandemic? Black Mirror. iPhone FaceTime someone all by itself? That's Black Mirror. The McFlurry machine is always broke when I roll up to Mickey D's? That is a recurring series of Black Mirror episodes and I want it to stop. But it also resonates with the culture because it shows us where humanity, society, and technology is going. If The Twilight Zone is an alternate universe showcase of basic carnal human instincts, Black Mirror reveals to us where those instincts are going to be taking us. Black Mirror head writer Charlie Brooker has even pinned down current society without writing an episode. He was recently quoted as saying, He doesn't want to write season 6 right now because the world is too bleak. But it's also a better world for having a show in it. An article in The Independent recently noted that entertainment options from The Invisible Man to I Am Mother to Wounds and Sorry to Bother You have all been influenced by Black Mirror. And the show is frighteningly accurate when it comes to predicting how social media can influence our world. The National Anthem and Hated in the Nation are both harbingers of how apps like Twitter can be used for good or evil. And word is that China is developing a networking system that is eerily similar to one used in the Nosedive episode. Heck, Waldo is an episode where a cartoon character gets elected president and fascism is allowed to rule the day. No one takes you seriously. That's why no one votes. And again, shut up and dance. I can do nothing in that episode. But I do enjoy the Aerosmith song of the same name. Brooker has claimed a number of eclectic influences on his own work with movies like Airplane and Evil Dead, as well as directors like Paul Verhoeven making the list. But one just needs to watch a few minutes of any Black Mirror season to see how heavily influenced it was by the granddaddy of them all. Suspended in time and space for a moment. Zone's cultural resonance has never been stronger, stemming from creator Rod Serling's own experiences with PTSD following his service in World War II. Writing stories like the ones found in his show would prove to be a healing outlet. And through his work in the realm of science fiction, he was able to inject societal commentary that normally wouldn't pass the censors of his day. Racism and struggles for equality were a hallmark of the 1960s, but rarely made it into TV shows. Serling found that by wrapping up his stories under the label of fantasy and including aliens and the occasional monster, he could get his message across the airwaves right under the ad agency's unsuspecting nostrils. The purpose, the point <clears throat> of a dramatic show, which is used as a vehicle of social criticism, is to involve an audience, to show them wherein their guilt lies, or at least indeed their association. If you want to just consider the horror genre, watch an episode like Mirror Image and see the evidence that it inspired flicks like Psycho and eventually Us. Number 12 Looks Just Like You is a precursor to The Stepford Wives, and the trade-ins would help usher in the concept of Get Out. The show had a huge impact on so many of the artists we admire today, from directors like Tim Burton and N. Night Shyamalan to writers like Stephen King and Gene Roddenberry. The series has been listed as the seventh greatest show of all time by Rolling Stone and placed fifth on TV Guide's list of the best dramas ever. 
1997, TV Guide listed To Serve Man at number 11, and It's a Good Life at number 31 in their best episodes in TV history rankings. And while the legacy of the Twilight Zone film is much darker, as a wrongful death case was brought on director John Landis as a result of two actors dying in an on-set accident, Landis was ultimately acquitted, but that horrific day changed movie set safety practices forevermore. Jordan Peele and his love for Zone are working to continue the legacy, but regardless if he's successful or not, one simply cannot overestimate the breadth of Twilight Zone's impact. Don't believe me? Go watch any Treehouse of Horror Simpsons episode. Are you back? Okay. Black Mirror has a handle on technology and where it's taking us, but for now it's Twilight Zone with the most cultural influence of just about any show ever made. It wins the round and goes up two to one. I mean, you shouldn't say such things as nonsense and ridiculous. Well, that's the way it goes. And now it's time for the wild card round, the creators. Yes, in the wild card round, we're going to pit the show's creators against each other. And if anyone could have seen that coming, it's probably the Twilight Zone or Black Mirror creators themselves. Rod Serling with his knowing grin and smoldering cigarette versus Charlie Brooker, the wonder kind who, if TV doesn't work out, can definitely fall back as an Apple Store genius. Rod Serling gets huge points not just for fighting for our country in World War II, but using his experiences and trauma as fuel for a creative outlet that would be ahead of his time. Years from now, we'll still marvel at how much Serling got right about humanity and our most intimate biases. But by then, we'll also be like, hey, I'm addicted to this new app, and that feels like a Black Mirror episode. In addition to being a brilliant television writer, Brooker is also an accomplished cartoonist, satirist, and yes, even critic. Is he certified on the tomato? I'll, I'll look into that and get back to you. His comedy influences, being from Britain, were naturally Monty Python, and the way he can inject subtle humor into even the bleakest Black Mirror episode is impressive. Even if the show ultimately leaves us feeling like our future is doomed, the amount of variety with which he can get us to that conclusion is astounding. In episodes like Playtest, it's video games. In The History of You, it's a fancy contact lens. And in USS Callister, it's just unabashed love for Star Trek. With Rod Serling, a hopeful ending was a little bit less of a pipe dream, but more often than not, we saw the light at the end of the tunnel just before a massive curveball blew our minds. In To Serve Man, the aliens are actually eating people. Nothing in the Dark is another classic, and not just because a super young Robert Redford was in it. Did Rod Serling know back then that Bob Redford would go on to be a secret member of Hydra? Am I really so bad? The leg up that Rod Serling will always have is his vintage appearances in each episode, later paid homage by Forrest Whitaker and Jordan Peele, Serling's handsome yet singularly unique look gave way to a voice that could both comfort and unsettle us in the same sentence. Whatever was about to happen, or no matter the nutty event we just witnessed, Serling was always there to offer appropriate context. And when you look back on those, it's also clear he was reiterating to the audience that the show we just watched wasn't just about extraterrestrials or the afterlife or ventriloquist dummies. It was about us. Any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. A case to be filed under M for Mankind. Brooker lets his tech wizardry do the talking for him most of the time, but it's no less effective. One could conceivably form a spin-off show just based on the practical appliance of his imagination. You're telling me you wouldn't watch a YouTube show about how to put your dead partner into a robot? Come on. You've spent hours watching grown adults unbox toys, but you're telling me you wouldn't check out soldiers using the neural implant mass? Get real, y'all. Brooker is a visionary, and I can't wait to see where the rest of his career takes him and us. But the winner of the wildcard round is the guy who came into everyone's living room via TV set once a week in the 1960s. America trusted Ed Sullivan to tell the kids what's going on in rock and roll, and it also trusted Rod Serling to deliver messages about ourselves wrapped in the palatable shell of finely crafted horror sci-fi. Rod Serling gets the point, and his baby goes up three to one. I think it's very possible to perform a, a function of providing adult, meaningful, exciting, 
challenging drama without dealing in controversy necessarily. It was gonna be an uphill climb for Black Mirror today, which is not to say don't watch it. In fact, I think it's one of the best shows on TV and its shadow looms large over the current version of The Twilight Zone. But for all the zones that have ever existed in history, this isn't just a nostalgia win. It's an earned victory that reminds us all what the 1960s were really about. Societal change through politics, laws, music, and storytelling. For that, we all owe Rod Serling a huge debt of gratitude. And I'm about to pay him respect right now. Submitted for your approval. A voting machine, the likes of which will determine the winner between two television programs. Although your narrator appears to be in control, the reality is he is trapped in a dimension from which he cannot escape, awaiting the right comment that may set him free. Or is he already free? Fate is what we make of it, both in your world and here in the Twilight Zone.